Hi everyone, it's Brian Strausser, Principal and Chief Executive here at BrightPath. And in this presentation, I'm going to walk you through the exact process that we use here at BrightPath to build a crisis management program for your organization. This will give you insight into our approach, but you can also use our methodology to go out and build your own crisis management program. Either way, I hope you find this presentation um, enlightening and insightful, and it helps you across your journey. Now here at BrightPath, we work with the world's leading brands to strategically manage uncertainty and disruption. As an organization, a consulting organization, we focus on the resilience domains of business continuity, crisis management, IT disaster recovery, and crisis communications. A little bit about me, just briefly, I have almost 30 years of experience in crisis management, business continuity, and crisis communications. And as a consultant, I have led the development and implementation of dozens of crisis or emergency management programs at Fortune 500 organizations, at large nonprofits, and even in the public sector. And I hold multiple professional certifications in business continuity, in physical and corporate security, emergency management, and other fields. I have an MBA from the University of Minnesota's Carlson School of Management, uh, a master's in international relations and contemporary war from King's College in London, and I am currently a doctoral student at Hamlin University here in Minnesota. But that's enough about me. Let's talk about building a crisis management program. So our process starts with discovery. Now, if you're building this for your own organization, you already know about your company, but this may give you some insights into some things to think about before you get too far down the road with your crisis management program. So we wanna learn about the organization. And for us, this is about conducting a thorough analysis of the organization. How is it structured? How does the company work? What is the risk landscape we're dealing with? As a part of this, we want to identify any compliance and legal or regulatory requirements that your organization may need to follow. And then we ask ourselves, well, how does this organization communicate and make the decisions today? Because we want to think about if this is the way you're doing it organically, how can we do and build something similar from a crisis standpoint? Then we want to think about a gap analysis in terms of where are you with your vulnerabilities, your threats, and your actual readiness to address those? And then we interview, we learn a lot of this by interviewing key stakeholders across the organization. Part of that is identifying other functions and teams that own other response processes that we want to make sure we align with. Business continuity, um, IT incident management, cybersecurity, physical security, there may be others. Then we want to look at what historical crisis incidents or disruptions has this company dealt with, and what does that tell us about the organization. And then we benchmark against the applicable industry standards and best practices, usually the ISO 22361 and crisis management standard. And from there, we build a roadmap for implementation of what we wanna do. And this all helps inform those initial concepts that we wanna think through in the next steps. That next phase is the initial conceptual discussion, or in other words, beginning with the end in mind. We want to look at how we can align leadership on what constitutes a crisis, so what is a crisis at this company? And then what are the different severity levels of crisis? Like what's not that big of a deal? What's a really big deal? And what is potentially material to the organization, the really most severe uh, disruptions that you can experience? Through this, we want to think about the operational level at which, the organizational level rather, at which we're going to target the crisis management process. So is this a smaller organization where the whole executive team needs to be involved in managing the crisis? Or as we find in most large companies, what's that level or two below the senior executives where we're really going to manage the day-to-day -day aspects of that crisis? Then we want to identify the critical stakeholders for involvement across departments and functions. And we want to think through some clear escalation pathways, including what decisions here need to be reserved to the senior executives, which we usually think of as the reputation management elements of this, uh, maybe large customer facing, um, but also certain levels of capital or expense decisions that need to be made at the executive level. From here, we want to start to put pen to paper and get conceptual agreement on the core elements of your crisis strategy and framework. So we think about a series of one-page documents that summarize our definitions of a crisis, 
our crisis management framework and the escalation process. And I'm gonna demonstrate these to you in a moment. Then we wanna roadshow those initial concepts with key stakeholders across the organization for their feedback and buy-in. In some cases, we've done 30 to 40 roadshows across large complex organizations to get buy-in from the different teams and iterate our strategies to best address what's gonna fit the organization. You wanna make sure you gain executive alignment and approval of this framework along the way. We want to think through what leadership roles should be integrated into this framework. We often think about an incident leader or an incident commander and a responsible executive as those two roles, and I'll show you in a moment. We want to develop examples and hypothetical situations to really validate the framework. Through this process, we want to clarify who owns decision-making in these crisis situations, and then we use this framework, once approved, as the foundation for the next phase, which is where we build the actual plans and elements of the program. So we're getting conceptual agreement first on how we're gonna do this, and then we use that to build out the plan. So when we think about a one-pager for a crisis management framework, this is the type of graphical one-pager we're talking about. Um, if you think about this representing a, a increasing level of scope and severity in a crisis or an incident, uh, and you start at the bottom with some different domains in which incidents happen. When they cross that crisis definition threshold uh, and you activate the process, then you have a corporate crisis management team or just a crisis management team um, led by two roles. The incident leader, who is the subject matter expert, who owns the process, who chairs the meetings and keeps the process running on track, and the responsible executive, who is a member of the executive team, who breaks the log jam of decision making with that crisis management team. And then above that, you have the CEO and executive staff, or you may call it something else, um, executive leadership team, uh, the senior leadership team. These are all some common acronyms. But we're, res we're reserving certain decision making rights at that level. And then above that, of course, is your board of directors or board of trustees uh, or your owners if it's a privately held company. And this is where you're reserving, again, major succession, major capital commitment, and some elements uh, that may fall into that realm that has been reserved to them through your governance processes. But in terms of a simple one-pager, this is the type of document we would want to get conceptual alignment on and we would use in a roadshow to kind of explain the strategy and iterate upon that strategy. When we think about severity levels or the definition of a crisis, this is the way that we often use this as some kind of tiered set of severity levels where the things at the bottom are common, they happen all the time, they're dealt with through your existing functions or entities in your organization. They're handled through SOPs and your current incident processes. Above that, you have things that are escalating that require more support or monitoring at that level three. So the things that they're not yet a crisis. You're not activating your crisis team, but they may need communication support or HR support, for example. But they're also things that you want to provide stronger visibility to so that they don't become a bigger deal. Or if they do become a bigger deal, you are prepared for them. And then above that, we think of two levels of crisis, major disruption, critical disruption. They're both crises. You're both, in both of these, you're going to activate your crisis management process, but we're delineating that one is a relatively run-of-the-mill crisis and the other one is a really big deal, novel or extreme impact that requires significant coordination to respond to. We've seen these as simple as two levels where something's not a crisis or it is a crisis and as complex as four, five, or six, just depending upon the, the scope and scale and complexity of your organization. And then lastly, as a part of a roadshow, we think about the life cycle of a crisis. How do we explain the process of going from constant monitoring to triaging alerts to assessing if we're in a crisis and if we need to activate to that activation and escalation decision? And then that constant cycle of I'm managing the crisis, I'm continually assessing if it's escalating or getting better. I'm deciding to escalate or not. I keep managing the crisis and in that loop until we're coming out of it and then we close out of that response and major recovery phase and we transition to long-term recovery. There are different ways of explaining this that are both simpler or more complex, but this is a typical starting point for us to explain that life cycle of a crisis. 
once you get through this phase and you have conceptual alignment, then we think about developing the programmatic details. So this is where the rubber really hits the road. You've got alignment on what you're doing. It's time to build the program. So the crisis management plan, we create and develop the detailed crisis management plan and related processes. That might include building a policy, building one plan document that acts as that all hazards overall framework and plan. You build your meeting agendas for what does it look like when you activate, what are those topics you're covering. And then again, you wanna make sure you're aligned and integrated with business continuity, IT incident management, cybersecurity, and other disruption or incident plans in the organization. Then we build and develop function or role specific checklist for members of the crisis management team. So if you have an incident leader and a responsible executive and a scribe as unique roles, we want checklists and whatever other supporting material is necessary for those roles. And then every function represented as a member of your crisis management team, we wanna build a specific role-based function checklist that really covers the things they need to do in a crisis. What this allows them to do is because the plan is relatively easy to understand. How do you get together? How do you coordinate? Who has those authorities? The checklist becomes the document the crisis management team really executes from, right? I bring my four, five, six, seven page checklist uh, upon receiving an activation alert. I've got to do these things before the first meeting. And then based on different scenarios or situations, I have a list of things I should execute. The next bucket is operational communication. So what are the communications templates I'm building that are a part of this process? Now, this is not the detailed reputation management plans your comms team might be putting together. But instead, it's the communication templates that would be sent as a part of your crisis management process. So, hey, we're activating. Here's the activation notification. Here is the situational update on where things stand today. Here's the briefing template we're going to use consistently to brief executives where necessary. And now we're coming out of the crisis. Here's our deactivation notification. And then lastly, we think about scenario-specific annexes because your plan is your all-hazards plan. It's really how the process works, how you activate it, how you collaborate during a crisis, how you exit a crisis. Your scenario-specific annexes are your scenario-specific details for things that you predict might happen. That might be active assailant. It could be ransomware and cyber extortion. It could be a natural disaster. Um, you'll have your own set of what's going to be important to you based on the specific risks and threats to your organization, but these are three common ones. The next phase is to really build the strategic communications plan for your rollout because you are managing this significant change process in the organization. So you want to make sure you've gained executive sponsorship and departmental buy-in early through your roadshows. It's really your first step with strategic communications. But you want to tailor uh, your messaging for different organizational levels and functions and think about using a variety of channels available to you. That might be uh, email, the intranet inside of your company, Microsoft Teams, town hall meetings, more roadshows, or even other methods in order to introduce and explain the program to stakeholders across the organization. And then think about what collateral material you could create that help explain key concepts, roles, and responsibilities. Now that that's done, it's time to train your new crisis management team and leaders. And it's important to think about the different audiences that you will need to train. So with the crisis management team, you want to select and formalize that team. Uh, you want to develop specific tailored training for them. We encourage this to be live training. So whether you do it in person or virtually or combination of both, you want this team to fully understand their role and have a chance to ask whatever questions that they have. You can even use scenario-based workshops to really put the new plan and team into some real world scenarios for context to help them better understand the plan. And then of course, you wanna regularly update and refine this training based on feedback, lessons learned, and evolving risks. Your executive team, you also want to make sure you train. And here you're really focusing on how do they stay informed, how issues will be escalated for them, what kind of communication can they expect during a crisis, and then where to go for questions. And you want to steer them towards your incident leader and the responsible executive or their functional representatives that are on the team because that's who's managing the day-by-day, moment-by-moment part of the crisis. 
Lastly, of course, you want to update and train other leaders in the organization. So again, high-level overview training in this case um, to provide awareness of the new program, and you really want to emphasize how to report or escalate a potential crisis into your new program and process. When the training is done, it's time to think about that initial exercise. And what we're trying to do here is build confidence and muscle memory by practicing the new plan, but you're also using this time to identify gaps that you may not have thought about as you work through the exercise together and you have the whole crisis management team involved. So here we're doing a, I would think of this as a straightforward crisis tabletop exercise. You should involve all levels of the organization, your crisis management team and even your executives. Um, when the exercise is over, you should do an after action report review, an AAR to capture lessons learned and then implement changes or improvements to your program based upon the outcomes from your exercise. And now you're at the end, but the end is really just the beginning. Now you're thinking about, now that you have the program implemented, how do you support and maintain the program for the long term? So with plan updates on at least an annual basis, you should review all of your program documentation and make sure everything is up to date, the checklists are up to date, that the plan itself is current. And of course, leverage lessons learned from exercises or actual activations to evolve your plan and program. With your CMT, your crisis management team, I would encourage you to hold at least quarterly or even monthly CMT meetings to keep the team informed. It's a great chance where you can leverage these for, for deep dives into different functional areas where those team members on your CMT can provide an update um, into what's going on in their part of the business, new risks or threats, incidents or disruptions that they've had to work through. Then practice. I would encourage you to exercise at least twice annually, if not quarterly. And over time, I would encourage you to evolve your process from just tabletops to more complex simulations where the team has to actually do the work as a part of the process. So they're actually having to write communications, send situational updates and more to really practice through those things. Lastly, awareness and feedback. I would encourage you to build good feedback loops with your stakeholders for continuous improvement. You should provide an update to your executives and to the board at least once annually. More often, if there's a lot going on, but at least one update a year on the program, remind them of the capabilities of your exercises, of your actual activations, where you've had success, what you're working on to improve the maturity. And of course, maintain your integration with um, your evolving business continuity, cybersecurity, and risk management efforts, and of course, ongoing training and resources for team members and executives. When we think about the evolution of exercises over time, this is how we think about this here at BrightPath, that we're often starting with an initial strategy with a new program of some basic exercises, maybe some metrics and reporting around that. Over time, we're moving towards a regular strategy of tabletop exercises, at least an annual or twice annual crisis management team exercise. We have a defined after action process and we have clear metrics and reporting. And then over time, as you get more mature, we want to make sure we're doing at least a once annual simulation as a part of your exercise strategy and even have unannounced functional simulations for communications, information security, and other teams across your organization. This, of course, varies a bit based on your regulatory requirements and what your specific challenges are, but I think this will give you some good examples. Now, that's a little bit about our process, and I hope that has helped you. If you need other help, here are some ways in which our team here at BrightPath would be happy to talk about ways these ways in which we can help you. The first here is our resiliency diagnosis. This is really what I laid out in our discovery phase here. It's a way of reviewing your current capabilities and program for business continuity, crisis management, crisis communications, or IT disaster recovery. We have built our own maturity models for the applicable ISO standards, and we use those to evaluate how you stack up against the defined controls in those standards. You get a, a detailed evaluation report that covers observations, recommendations, and a roadmap for implementation and maturity. And then we present our findings to your executives, which both explain the current state of the program, the things you should do to improve your maturity, and the business case that supports that investment. We can also help you with program development. 
um, where we can develop and help you implement your business continuity, crisis management, or ITDR programs. We build customized programs that best fit the needs of your organization, and we can guide this all the way from initial discovery, clear through the support and maintenance period, and get this in place in your organization. If you'd rather do it yourself, we also sell our crisis management plan templates, including our checklists, our meeting agendas, and all of that in a package that you can take and then customize for your own purpose. If you're just looking for exercise help, we can help you with that as well by developing, facilitating, and evaluating crisis tabletop and simulation exercises. We do everything from straightforward natural disaster scenarios all the way to complex multi-day ransomware and cyber extortion exercises. You get all of that uh, in terms of building, facilitating, and evaluating the exercise to a detailed after action report with observations and recommendations, and then presentations by our team to your leaders that really explain what we've seen and how we think you should go about improving. And then lastly, we offer managed services. So we can take over and you can outsource your entire business continuity crisis management or ITDR program to us to manage on, for example, as a crisis management as a service basis. Um, we lead programs like this today at a diverse set of clients from energy utilities to healthcare technology to health insurers, uh, quick service restaurant chains, and more. And these are just some of the ways we can help you, but they're the ones that kind of best align with building a crisis management program like we have focused on here. So that's our approach to building a crisis management program. I hope that you found this helpful. You can contact us at any time at contact at brightpath.com or visit our website at brightpath.com to learn more about how we can help you, our other videos, articles, uh, free and premium courses. Thanks for your time. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.